Yeah. So please be advised that uh, we're recording this webinar and that we will be sharing the recording later on in our uh, social media handles so you can also share it um, to the wider um, audience. Yeah, this is, I think this is going to be a full house uh, today for this webinar. We have uh, more than 200 registrants for the event and uh, we're happy to uh, welcome you all in this webinar so um, we can um, get right on. Good morning again, good afternoon and good evening to all of you wherever you are in the world. Uh, welcome to our webinar entitled The Role of Evaluation in Achieving the SDGs. Um, this webinar has been made possible through the combined efforts of the Asia Pacific Evaluation Asso uh, Association and the VNR theme of the Asia Pacific Regional um, Strategy, um, in International Institute for uh, Environment and Development, and the APC Hub. Um, my name is uh, Dorothy May Albiento. I'm a co leader of the VNR theme of the APEA and also a co-leader of EVA Youth Asia. I know we have participants coming from all over the world, looking at our chat here. We have people from um, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, Ghana, and um, from the Netherlands as well. So welcome everyone to the webinar. Um, we are delighted to have all of you here with us today, and thank you for really taking the time to, to join us in this webinar. So again, while waiting for others to join, it's still, I think we still have uh, a lot of people coming in, so please um, introduce yourselves in the chat. So tell us your name, uh, your country, uh, your organization, and can greet us in your own language. And again, um, for those coming in, we are recording this webinar. Uh, we will be sharing the recording later on in our social media handles so you can um, um, go back uh, to it or share it uh, with your other um, networks. Okay, so let's get things started. I'd like to call on Ms. Uh, Sarabi Seth, my uh, co-leader in the VNR team, for her opening remarks. Sarabi um, has been working as a young evaluator with the government of India. Uh, she's a member of Eval Youth Asia and also the co-founder co of Eval Youth um, India. She's uh, very passionate about evidence and data-backed policy formulation. So Rabi, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, a very good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Uh, a very warm namaste from me, I'm Surbhi Seth. And um, so I'll begin by saying that the sustainable development goals that were adopted to bring about transformational and lasting change in all aspects of the lives of humanity by 2030 with this promise and this vision to leave no one, no one behind. Um, and then, you know, there were 150 targets and many, many more indicators to measure these SDGs, making it somewhat complex, um, you know, with a system of intertwining and cross-cutting goals. And in this sort of a complex format, I believe that regular and institutionalized monitoring and evaluation become all the more important. And thus the VNRs, the voluntary national reviews are a very crucial part of not just individual countries presenting, you know, their comprehensive evidence of progress that they make in the SDGs, but also for these countries such as India as well to realign, rationalize and reinvigorate our efforts towards achieving SDGs. And um, with that, I'm going to say that I'm uh, looking forward to the excellent presentation today that Stefano will be giving. And I hope to myself learn a lot to, with uh, today's launch and webinar event. Thank you, Dirk. Thank you so much, Surabi, for setting the stage for this really very interesting and highly relevant topic. So now, without further ado, it is my honor to introduce to you our resource speaker for this webinar. He is the head of the Monitoring, Evaluation, and Learning Department at the International Institute for Environment and Development, or IIED, and he leads the organization's learning and impact framework. He is also an evaluation specialist, a former council member of the UK Evaluation Society, and uh, a former advocacy lead of EVAL SDGs. He's also the editor of a briefing series called Effective Evaluation for the SDGs and a lead author of the guidebook evaluation to connect national priorities. 
which is a guide for commissioners and managers. Stefano has also led the initiative Better Evaluation for Sustainable Development and has led and managed evaluations for various international organizations. He has actually a whole, whole arsenal of accomplishments that I can share with you, but I don't want to take the time from his presentations. But before I give the floor to our speaker, I'd like to let everyone know that you have any, if you have any questions or comments on his presentation, please uh, post them in the chat box. We will have a few minutes after his talk to respond to your questions or comments. So without further ado, everyone, please join me in welcoming our speaker for today's webinar, Mr. Safano Tierico. Hi, uh, thank you very much, Dorothy and Sarabi, for the very nice words and uh, for the excellent, <clears throat> uh, for the excellent uh, welcoming. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to say thanks, uh, big thanks to all the organizers, APEA, Eval for Action, and the EPC Hub, uh, to give me this great opportunity to share with you today some ideas, some thoughts, and to kind of, you know, hear your your views on how evaluation is doing uh, for the SDGs. We've been working on this with partners, many partners, so it's not just uh, IID or just me, but actually a lot of uh, brain, a lot of people involved uh, in some of the issues that I'm gonna present today um, on evaluation and SDGs uh, since 2015, so since the agenda was signed. And I think it's been a very, very long, um, a useful and insightful journey so far, um, and so and so it's it's great to to have new new friends uh, coming along this pathway. Um, so I'm gonna try to share my presentation now. I hope everything is gonna go well. Um, let me try. Maybe. You can, Dorothy, you can say if, uh, if, that, if that works. So let me just try to share my screen. Can you see the screen now? Yes, we can. Okay, so if I put up the presentation, can you see it? in full screen or? Oh, we, we see it with the presenter view. Okay, so let me try again then. One second to sort out the technicalities. Okay, now? Yes, we Is see the it right... in full screen now. Okay, fantastic. So now it's the right, it's the right screen. Great. Um, good. So, <clears throat> I mean, I should be used to actually present online. So, you know, after two years of online working and pandemic, but it looks like I still have a way to go. Um, but uh, so, so today we're gonna, I'm gonna share some reflection about evaluation and SDGs and. I want to really to make a comment about this uh, presentation. So you can, what you can see here is actually a mangrove forest. And this mangrove, when we talk about the role of evaluation in achieving the SDGs, I want to share the mangrove because the mangrove are gonna play a very key role in, uh, um, in reaching the 2050 targets of uh, a net zero emission economy uh, because they actually can you know, can store a lot of carbon dioxide. And so what my hope, uh, you know, to make a useful, I hope a useful analogy is that evaluation can be probably not as important as the mangrove, but close to it. So we can actually, you know, at the end of the day, be very happy about what we have done. Um, and so what's the journey towards sustainable development? Uh, um, it's 2021 now, and we are, we are meant to achieve the SDGs by 2030. So really there isn't much time. And I think that's why it's worth looking backwards um, and think about what we have achieved so far and what we still need to do. 
And if we go back with our memories to 2015, we may think that back then the future looked brighter. Okay. Well, actually, that's not really true because in, in November 2016, one year after uh, the SDGs were agreed and, and the Paris Agreements was agreed, actually Trump got elected. And one of the first thing he did was to announce the retirement of the US from the Paris Agreement, which happened in 2020. Uh, so they actually in 2020, on 4 November 2020, the US formally withdrew from the Paris Agreement. So all the great hope we had in 2015, soon after that actually were kind of, you know, uh, a bit uh, diminished by the fact that some uh, very, you know, some of the world leader, they didn't really believe in those commitments. But then again, in 2019 and 2021, some good things happened because the European Commission communicated the adoption of the European Grid Deal, which is basically a commitment with, uh, um, with great you know, uh, resources to create an efficient circular economy and to make Europe carbon neutral by 2050. And also, as soon as Biden got elected in 2021, um, the U.S. actually joined return to the Paris Agreement. So all of this to say is that sometimes the, the journey towards sustainable development does feel a bit like a roller coaster. Um, and, uh, and therefore, it's not really a linear path. You know, what we tend to see is always this very nice uh, linear timeline which brings us to 2030 to achieve the SDGs and then 2050 to, to get uh, zero emissions. But it doesn't really work the way. Actually, it's more of a roller coaster with a lot of high and down with high and low points. And I guess the other key point I want to share before going into the, the crux of the matter is that now as never before, time is of the essence. Um, a few months ago, actually, was leaked a report by some scientists participating in the in the report uh, on, on, on climate, which by 2026, we really have to change consumption and production patterns if we want to get to, to stay down 1.5, uh, the, the 1.5 target. And, and by 2030, we need to achieve the SDGs. So we, we only need, we only have nine years, right? And actually the trajectory doesn't look like we're gonna, uh, the, the current path uh, we are now in terms of, uh, um, in terms of um, climate change is that we are gonna uh, overcome the 1.5 target. And it's probably more likely that we're gonna have a two degrees future after 2030 if we don't act very quickly. So the SDGs is really like navigating, navigating through complexity. And uh, uh, I think these slides actually does explain it you know, by itself. Uh, more than the slides, actually the number of the framework. We have 17 goals, 169 targets, 231 indicators actually, not 232. And there's one big question, how do we know if we are on the right track? So uh, the complexity is huge and we have to give very concrete and clear answer in order, in order to achieve our goals. So Agenda 2030 is a massive step forward, I believe, because it does recognize all the interrelationships between the human economic and, uh, and the environment, the economic development and the environment but it can be quite a huge burden for the planners and the implementers to have to think how we can implement the agenda alongside our national priorities, alongside our you know, local priorities. How are, we gonna, how are we gonna make this happen? Or is actually a priority for people who work in national and local administration, since it's so difficult to understand what are the key targets and goals at times. And actually the SDGs have helped to boost the creation of data on sustainable development. If we ask ourselves, what have we achieved so far with the SDGs? I would have my first, my number one answer would be data. 
And data is a big thing in nowadays, you know? Um, many say in the business sector that data is the new oil. And the fact that the SDGs have boosted the creation of data is in fact a very good thing. Um, and we can see that, you know, um, by just, go, just looking around the number of initiatives which have happened to strengthen the statistical capacities in Latin American and African countries, the number of dashboards that have emerged with sustainable development data. So I do believe that by 2021, what we have now is a much better system, data system worldwide and actually much improved national statistical system from what we had in 2015. But there is still a huge way to go. As you can see from the slide, that's an assessment of the uh, different indicator tiers. And as you can see, the green ones are the tier one data where we have methodology and, um, and actually data. So the indicators where we have methodology and data are the green ones. The yellow ones are tier two, which means the indicator where we have, where we have um, a methodology, but not a huge amount of data developed against them. And all the red ones are the ones which don't have either data or methodology agreed. So if you want to know more about all the data and all the kind of results achieved so far against the SDGs, these are two great resources which I want to share with you. I'm sure most of you will know about them, but our world in data and the SDG tra tracker, which are part of the same initiative, they have plenty of analysis, which is fact-based, and I think very honest and transparent about what's happening in the world. Of course, it's based on the data that we have, so there are also many gaps. But then, you know, <clears throat> As I was saying, I think there is still a huge gap. And the huge gap is between the evidence creation and the use of evidence for decision making. So I believe that evaluation, very humbly, but it can help to fill that gap. If evaluation becomes a useful resource, which helps decision maker and civil society to make sense of that data. And eventually, you know, that can be a very valuable asset to identify the most appropriate trajectories for each country towards sustainable development. So how can evaluation do that? Well, I think first of all, it can connect evidence to national and local decision-making processes. We all know, you know, evaluation, they need to be responded by the board, by, by the <clears throat> decision-maker who received them. So they can have quite an important, they can be quite an important route to connect evidence production with decision-making. Uh, by providing all the rationale, uh, underpinning the judgments on the value of different policies. You know, it can be, there are a lot of conflicting interests when we talk about policies and data can be interpreted in different ways. So evaluation can be, a facil can be facilitating uh, processes to generate value judgments by facilitating different uh, interests at stake. And then I guess, I guess one of the most important points, which is linked to the SDGs and to Agenda 2030 is by linking all the data that we produce back to the founding principles of Agenda 2030. This is somehow a way to actually overcome the difficulty and complexity of this massive indicator framework that we have. How can we actually distill very simple messages coming out of this huge amount of complex data? I think evaluation can do can play a role in doing that. So as I was saying, evaluation can be used by decision maker, can be used by civil society, can be used by many different stakeholders. And I think this is the strength of, of evaluation, can be used by parliamentarians to make the government accountable. Um, again, I don't think evaluation today is used by all these decision maker actors. Um, and I think you know we could do much better we as evaluator to reach out and to try to understand the needs of different actors. Of course, in order to happen though, in order for evaluation to be to be uh, useful and used, it needs to be linked to national decision making processes. On the right hand side, you see what has happened in Finland, where evaluation does play an important role in the parliamentary election. So actually, all the candidates and, and their parties, they need to consult with the evaluation team, which makes a sustainable development, uh, development evaluation just before the election. The evaluation is produced and published just before the election. 
And all the candidates, they have to, to react to those findings and say what they're gonna do if they would be elected. Now, we all agree Finland is a bit of an outlier in sustainable development, but it is actually useful to, to see what's going on there and, and to take inspiration and see what's feasible in our own country. And then I think, you know, evaluation can shed light on complexity. As I said before, you know, the, couple, the, 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 the human and the natural system uh, are linked and we tend to inf influence the natural system very often in a negative way, but we need to understand how we can better interact and how can, you know, uh, the human activities uh, help to actually create uh, a future which is sustainable. So one of the points I tried to stress before was the principles. The principle really help to see the forest rather than the trees. So going back to the complexity of the agenda, if we go, if we read the agenda 2030, when we started reading the agenda 2030, we thought, gosh, you know, there aren't really principles in there, right? There, there aren't, you know, some common messages uh, stated transparently, but what we tried to do with colleagues was to actually distill them from the words of the agenda. And we came up with these eight principles, which when we brought the guide on SDG evaluation, we thought they actually are uh, fairly, um, fairly a, a, fair, a fair reflection of, of the agenda. So I think evaluation, if we think about these principles, then we can come up with evaluation questions and we can come up with our analytical assessment guided by what the key messages of the agenda. Again, these are not principles stated by the UN or by the signatory countries of Agenda 2030. These are the principles which we as you know, researchers, evaluators would join to write the guide on SDG evaluation thought actually are a fair reflection of the agenda and could help to, to develop evaluation question for SDG and sustainable development evaluation. And here I want to show this graph, which was developed by the evaluation team again in Finland, um, because I think it's a fantastic example of how evaluation can help to synthesize the challenges of our time. As you see on the top left of the corner, you have the humanity sweet spot, where we actually meet all of our needs and, uh, <clears throat> and also the, within the means of the planet. And on the other, uh, on the right hand side, instead at the top, you have those who actually meet the, uh, the, human, uh, the human needs, but not the natural needs. And on the left hand side, you have the countries which are struggling to meet both. So again, I'm sure we can all argue whether the different countries should be. This was the assessment of the, uh, the Finnish team, but I, I think it's a great way to simplify, you know, how to simplify the challenge that we are all facing. But I think in order to do that, an evaluation really needs to change. At the moment, you know, what we call sustainable development evaluation, to be honest with you, I don't think it exists. Aiming to, but, it doesn't really exist. We can only improve. We are all doing some, some sustainable development evaluation, but there is still much that we can all change together. And here are some reflections on how we could change in order to, uh, to do that. So the first thing is, I think evaluation should look less at the past and more at the future. The future is gonna look very different. This year we had a 1.2 increase scenario. So uh, the, 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 climate, the climate change we experienced this year was 1.2 uh, uh, increase uh, compare, in comparison to the pre-industrial level. And we already saw a lot of uh, differences between a one uh, degree scenario. This is because of course the feedback loop which exists in, in nature, which we can't control and <clears throat> And therefore the future will look very different if we will experience a 1.5, a two degree scenario or a three degree scenario. So I think it's really important at this point to think more about the future rather than the past. And evaluation has been asking itself, you know, the key question for evaluation has always been what works. But I think that the new question, the most important one is 
what will work in different scenarios? The what works question is likely not to be very useful for the future. So we have to think about the different type of environments that we can find ourselves and how the different intervention will interact with them. Even when we assess previous interventions, especially if we want to actually, uh, both in case we want to make recommendation for the future, but also if we want to make an assessment of the past, we need to know if a specific intervention was actually useful to, to create sustainability in the future. So here I'm sure you've all seen the IPCC <coughs> summary for decision maker, but these are the different scenarios we are facing. Again, thinking about the different scenarios. So we have a 1.5 global warming, temperate change experience with the fourth globe, and then the four, uh, the four, global, four degrees global warming is going to feel very, very different. Likewise, on the bottom left, you have um, the, the different precipitation change in terms of uh, annual mean. So the annual mean precipitation change. And then how much we will experience drought or, or wetland. And so this, you know, this scenario needs to, be, to become common practice in evaluation, I think it's something that we're not really doing at the moment. Likewise, it's not just climate change. We talked, I talked a lot about climate change because uh, of course COP is, is approaching and it's the big challenge of our time, but even the COVID pandemic, which is also the big challenge of these days. Here we have a very useful graph from the FAO, which shows how the global pandemic can affect undernourishment and hunger. And again, interestingly, they talk about different scenarios. Some, a second key point for me is that evaluation needs to look, to, to feel and look and be much more about mutual accountability. I think so far, uh, at least, you know, many evaluation have been involved. They're very much, they feel very much like top-down exercises you know, we deliver a report to funders of certain initiatives, and then we assess how the, the implementers have done. But to be honest, now it's, you know, the, there is, when we think about the SDGs, we need to think about how much, how much has been spent to achieve the SDGs. But there is a massive 2.5 trillion gap of money every year to achieve the SDGs. So whenever we make an SDG evaluation and we think, have they achieved these results? Then, you know, we also need to think about how much did they have to achieve these results? Where the policies and programs and this, the disbursement of funding actually helpful to achieve those, 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 those goals. Equity and no one left behind. Again, big, a big uh, message, clear message from the initiative. And as we see, you know, the, the inequality in the world has been rising. Um, there is, you know, the very famous elephant curve on the right hand side, which shows how the inequality has been constantly rising uh, since, since uh, 1980. And, uh, and then, you know, um, again, when we, when we make an evaluation, we need to think about uh, more than anything else, whether the, the needs of the most affected population of those living in poverty and exclusion have been met or not. And, you know, if these, you know, here I want to present a global challenge, but of course this challenge can be reflected also in very small intervention or in national intervention. If we think about COVID and the, the administration of vaccines so far, has it been equal and, uh, um, has it helped to tackle the pandemic? If we had to evaluate the global response to COVID-19, what would be our evaluative judgment? This is the situation right now, updated as to two days ago. Most of the countries in the global South, especially in the African countries, they haven't reached the vaccine. And it could be logistical problem, it could be you know, um, <clears throat> data, data pr protection problem, but again, the, the the challenge is there. 
again, the economic impact of, of a 1.5 world is going to be affecting the economies more in the global south than in the global north. These are data, again, and facts. And this is a simulation of what could happen uh, in a, in a 1.5 scenario. So evaluation needs to change also in terms of integration and coherence. Of course, it's easier said than done. We all think, you know, how, you know, we need to do it, but how can we do it? And here there are some ideas, expert judgment, drawing system, modeling, participatory assessment of synergies and trade-offs. To be honest with you, it is challenging and difficult to make an assessment of integration and coherence, but I think that it's probably the least of our problem because evaluator loves to come up with new methods. You know, when, if you go to an evaluation conference, you know, there are plenty of methods every year coming up. And so I think these actually can be the most, in, you know, the, the, the part, the most uh, fun uh, part of, of the job, if you like. Um, <clears throat> And here you see, you know, the type of challenge we have had. So the, the, the countries which are growing the most are also the one that usually use more resources. We need economic growth in order to tackle poverty. At the same time, economic growth causes problems with the natural system, climate and biodiversity. How do we tackle that? Of course, that's the most, you know, the most striking example, but we have others. Again, here is deforestation, we need, you know, to feed more people in the world, but at the same time, we need the forest to, um, <clears throat> to store carbon. And, and as you can see, agriculture plays a big role in deforestation at the, at the moment. So how do we do that? These are all the challenges and trade-offs. When we talk about SDGs, it's not a, a rosy picture. It's nothing easy. It's actually very, you know, how, at the very crux of the matter is how we, how we tackle the the, uh, the how we assess the synergies and trade-offs between goals and we find the good balance between them. And here, you know, there are some useful resources developed, for example, by the Stockholm Environment Institute, how to, you know, assess whether interventions are um, creating synergies or trade-offs. Finally, uh, the, we need to assess the universal effect. Again, the economic impact of a 1.5 world is going to affect every world. So if a country decides, you know, and we, we are seeing this happening now at, at the COP, at the negotiation at the COP and the, the decision that each country will make actually will have a huge, uh, a huge, uh, will have huge consequences on the rest of the world. You may think, well, maybe, you know, if I am assessing a small program in, uh, in Italy or in, in Ghana or, or even like in, in the US, that doesn't really affect me. But um, if you're assessing a program which does have, you know, um, which does have uh, implication for other countries, this is very, very important. So universality is not just about the universality of rights, but also the universal effects that the program or a policy can create. And here we see a palm oil value chain. When we assess, you know, any kind of SMS program, we should think about, you know, the different ramification of, of a value chain. Um, again, putting this slide because I think it's striking, you know, what the, the effects that a policy or a program in a particular country can be very, very useful to tackle COVID in one country but they can affect the prices of vaccine, they can affect the availability of vaccine, and therefore those can have global implication, and we all know that. So I would like to finish with a word of hope. Sustainable development at times really feels like going to the moon in a rush against time. And of course, the journey is still long and full of dangers. And, uh, and probably we only have a little bicycle at our disposal, or at least this is what we, it feels at the moment. But having said that, I think, you know, there is nothing that really can stop our creativity and enthusiasm to come up with solutions. Um, and eventually I think we'll get there, but we need to hurry up. And also evaluation needs to step up and play its part 
Because at the moment, when we talk about national evaluation of SDGs, we're really talking about three countries. And in three countries, three countries have done an SDG evaluation. And, and I think, you know, then there may be a lot of great initiatives happening, but at least we are not well coordinating, we are not working well together in order to, to do our, our uh, part. Um, so these are the reflections. I really hope that you'll get in touch. Uh, there you have my Twitter handle and my, and my email, and I look forward to the conversation now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Diarico, for that very insight insightful yet thought-provoking discussion. Um, indeed, uh, you have pointed out the importance of uh, using evaluation, particularly by decision makers and stakeholders in bridging the gap and facilitating the achievement of the SDGs. But then, as you said, it's easier said than done, but there's hope, right? So we have a couple of questions um, in the chat for you. Um, one, we have a question from um, Lynn and um, she, she's asking how often are the SDG goals supposed to be evaluated in a year? Well, to be honest, there is, I, 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 I don't like to give prescriptive answer in a sense that I think the SDG goal, uh, it really depends what you are evaluating. Um, there is a, VN, a voluntary process for countries to present a review to the high level political forum, the country can put forward their uh, candidature to send their voluntary national review. And each country can decide how many times they want to do it. So some countries haven't sent a VNR at all. I'll let you think which one they haven't. And others actually, they, they, they have committed to send the VNR many times. Every year, in fact, if I remember well, and I'm, I may be about a bit outdated, but if we want to do some naming and shaming, I think Uganda is committed to do it every year. And I think the United States of America haven't sent even one, at least I'm not sure if, if recently they have. So I apologize if they have. But um, as far as I think a couple of years ago, they did. So it really depends. The follow up review process of the SDGs is really voluntary and up to every country to decide when. For example, interesting example comes from Finland. They decide to send the PNR whenever we have a national evaluation. All right, thank you so much. Um, I hope that answers your question, Lynn. Uh, we have another um, question from Mr. Dirk Hoffman. Um, he says, excellent presentation. And her, his question is, when would you, where would you see the place for SDG evaluation in the upcoming COP26? It's a very good point. Thanks, Dirk. Dirk. Um, I think there could be a place. Uh, and I think one of the challenges that the COP climate agreement process and the SDGs are very much uh, unrelated, apart from the fact that the UNF Triple C has is one of the um, is one of the repository for the climate indicator for the the climate goal, climate action goal. The UNF Triple C basically is one of the of the custodian agency for gathering data on climate action. Unfortunately, also climate action is one of those areas where we don't really have data. So. I guess the challenge is there isn't, you know, the, there is still a huge disconnect between the COP and the SDGs. Um, and so I think uh, it would be really good if the, the VNR could have a specific section around how climate influences all the other goals. Because what we're talking about here is not just a goal in itself, right? That but actually is a situation which is gonna affect the achievement of all the others. So whenever we talk about targets and baseline, 
you know, against those targets gather maybe in 2015 or in 2019, then we have actually to add all the consequences that extreme events may have caused afterwards. Um, and so I think, you know, there could be much more linkages and I think there should be, you know, uh, probably, you know, countries could have uh, a way to explain how, you know, the climate crisis has affected the achievement of different SDGs and what they plan to do in order to, to adapt their development to the new climate. All right, thank you so much for that. We have another from uh, Sir Dirk Franz. So him, his comment is that complexity can paralyze. So if you could measure only three indicators to see if the SDGs are being achieved, which ones would they be? <laughs> Tough question. <laughs> if I could measure only three. Yes. <laughs> That's a very good point. Um, it's a big question. I can't answer on top of my head. Can I can I come back at the end of the all the questions? I'm gonna think about it just for a sure, second. Or you can maybe uh, you can also post your um fun. And also, I would actually say that if people oh, in the audience you, have got uh, their own about their, their own idea. <laughs> Sorry, Dorothy, I couldn't hear you. Maybe. Just go ahead. Go ahead, Stefano. No, I was suggesting that maybe people in the audience have got their own idea. So I would suggest this is more ah. of a, a chat box uh, <laughs> discussion. I'm yes. Gonna, I'm going to say if my own. You can also post your um, answers in the chat box. So if anyone wants to um, share your answer to Mr. Dirk's question, uh, you can also um, answer in our chat box. So we have a um, very interesting discussion as well in, in the chat box. All right, so we have a couple more very interesting insights from our audience here. Uh, we have um, uh, also a question and comment from Salman Mafsud. Uh, he, he or she says, um, I believe the role of the government is more important to evaluate the localizations of SDGs and consolidating the impacts. How can we capacitate or sensitize the government to take it up and evaluate what is being done? Yes, I think the principles of SDGs evaluation are quite, uh, are quite useful in that sense. So you can use, you know, when you work with decision makers and you come up, for example, with questions for evaluation, you can always refer back to the principle and think, am I actually asking the right question? Am I assessing um, you know, the facts on the most vulnerable population or on people living, living in poverty and exclusion? Am I actually, when I'm doing the assessment of a particular health program, am I actually looking also at the effects of that policy on other, on other situations? Am I thinking about the future? And so, and therefore, you know, the, the different scenarios when I'm assessing a particular intervention, as this intervention talked about the different possible scenarios, climate scenarios ahead, of course, the big challenge is always the fact that there are too many evaluation questions in an evaluation already. So I sometimes I do feel bad because we always, you know, because now we have come up with new questions, right, about sustainability. So I guess the question is also sometimes what you do with government is there is a massive now, a very, you know, a, a massive. Uh, that has always been, I would say, for the last 10 years, um, focus on impact and effectiveness. Can we sacrifice a bit of that focus in order to prioritize sustainability? Are we so, do we really need to be so focused on the what works question? Since actually the most interesting question in this day is what will work? So, I guess, you know, there could be, that is also a very important argument to be made because you can't address all the questions. If we look at the OECD DAC criteria, there are two main, you know, there are, there are impact and effectiveness. Okay, they have revised the, the criteria, which is great. And I really love the OECD DAC criteria. But I guess when we do an evaluation and we have to address every single criteria of the OECD DAC, do we really need to focus so much on impact and effectiveness? Can we rebalance a bit? 
that would be the question for me when you're running an evaluation for local governments or for national governments as well. All right. So um, we have a couple of questions here in our audience asking if um, asking to share if we, we're going to share the presentation. Yes, we will be sharing with you uh, the presentation and the recording also of the presentation after our webinar. Uh, so we have uh, time, I think, for one more um, question. Um, Rizwan from Sri Lanka is asking, is there any possibility to measure the level of evaluation in achieving the SDGs? wise Yes, I think, um, so first of all, you have your voluntary national reviews that the country submits. So if you are interested, you can go on the UN website and you can find all the evaluations that are submitted usually in English uh, and, and in other you know, lang key languages for each country. So you can find your, uh, you know, the Sri Lanka national PNR. Uh, I'm sure you can ask Azela as well uh, about it. There is then uh, there are all sources that are published as well by the different agencies. The website that I uh, shared before, they're very good sources, which also have national breakdown. Uh, so for each goal, you can actually assess how a country is doing if data is available. And then I guess though, when you make th that's for the measuring, okay, and tracking. But I think evaluation is something else. Evaluation is to say, okay, this is the data. So is this a good thing or not? And I think to do that, of course, you need to engage different constituencies because what looks good for a particular group may be not good for another. So I think you know, whenever you know, then then when whenever you have got all that data, which you know there is quite a lot available already, then you can then you can uh, share it with constituencies, and and that's what also we advocate in the in the guidebook. Always, you know, use participatory processes. The other thing I would like to say is the amount of data in these days about sustainable development has increased hugely. Also have a look at the Copernicus uh, satellite data, which have a lot of information about climate change and it tracks you know, things happening in different parts of the world. So when we talk about the physical world, now we also have you know, satellite data which can be used. Um, so I would say, you know, just the, 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 first, the first thing to do is look around, there's plenty of data around to make assessments and then facilitate processes with different co co constituencies. Hello? I don't know if it's myself or Surabi who is blocked. Or 30. Can you hear Hello? me? Hello, yeah, sorry. Yes, yes, sorry, my connection was cut. No worries. All right, All right. so thank you so much again, um, Mr. Zefano, for that wonderful sharing and also for our audience for your very, very insightful thoughts. And if you want, I, I think if you have any and other questions for Mr. Stefano, you can um, get in touch with him in his Twitter or the email that you shared um, earlier. Okay, now let's listen um, to the experience of Nigeria in using evaluation to achieve SDGs. We have a video recording from Dr. Bala Yunosa, the Senior Technical Advisor under the Office of the Senior Special Assistant to the President on Sustainable Development Goals in Nigeria. Nigeria commenced the country-led evaluation of priority SDGs since January 2019, precisely SDG 1 on food poverty, SDG 3 on qualitative health and well-being, SDG 4 on qualitative and inclusive education. This country-led evaluation of priority SDGs are basically for learning and accountability, uh, evidence-based reporting, specifically SDG progress reporting, as well as voluntary national review reporting. And for key learning, uh, if you like, uh, policy advocacy around the global goals. 
uh, SDG 3 and 4 evaluation is now completed and the key findings and recommendations ready to be presented to the Nigerian and international community. Thank you. All right, I think, can you hear me? Sorry about that. So um, thank you, Dr. Bala, uh, for showing us a very good example of really how evaluations can be used to report achievements in the SDGs. And uh, now we come to the other agenda for this webinar. Um, today, we are launching the guide on the use of evaluation for SDG monitoring and reporting. So this publication was commissioned by the um, UNFPA um, Regional Office in the Asia Pacific and the Asia Pacific Evaluation Association. This guide serves as a resource material for public institutions who are responsible for SDGs and DNRs, including the private sector and other organizations. And it really highlights how evaluations can help in implementing development activities with special reference to the SDGs and how they can help in supplementing the role played by national monitoring systems to generate quality evidence and progress and impacts. It can also help in um, using, it can also be a guide uh, that can be used to prepare a better VNRs and SDG progress reports and highlights the importance of a proper communication strategy to enhance the use of evidence. So you can now access this publication in APS website. We hope it will be a useful tool for all of you, all of you to help track uh, progress towards SDGs. And also, um, I, we hope that it will be uh, an insightful guide for using evaluation findings and recommendations to better achieve the SDGs. Um, we will share the link to the guide in the chat, so you can all um, download it. Okay, here it is. Maduka has shared the, the link to the guide in the chat box. To close the event, I'd like to call another colleague from Evaluate Asia, Ms. Hasiti Samarasinghe. Hasiti is an independent, independent social uh, researcher and a young and emerging evaluator focusing on agricultural value chains, environment, rural livelihoods, and gender. She is a co-leader of Evaluate Sri Lanka. Uh, as well. The floor is yours, Hasidi. Hi, me. Uh, thank you. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Great. So today I think we have participants from all over the world. So good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to everyone. I uh, hope you all are doing well and safe. Uh, I'm so happy to witness the launch of the guide on uh, use of evaluation for SDG monitoring and reporting. Uh, as well as to participate in this insightful discussion on the role of evaluation in achieving SDGs. A huge thank goes to our speaker, Stefano Dierico, Head of Monitoring, Evaluation and Learning of IIED, for his interesting and thought-provoking inputs. It was an excellent presentation where me, myself, learned a lot. Uh, and of course, our co-leader for Evaluate Asia and FIA VNR team, Dorothy May, thank you for the wonderful moderation as always. Well, thank you, Surabhi Seth, for the warm welcome and opening up the platform. Uh, and a special thank goes to Dr. Bala Yunusa from Nigeria for sending thoughts on how evaluation is used for SDGs. Of course, uh, I should not forget the team behind this successful webinar, May, Surabhi, Humayun, Nasela, Ramdika, and uh, Maduka. Thank, uh, thank you for all the hard work. Uh, last but not least, I would like to thank our participants for joining us and for their active engagement. And I would like to invite all of you to keep in touch with Asia Pacific uh, Evaluation Strategy for more exciting uh, events and programs like this. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Dorothy. Thank you, Hasidi. Um, Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, you can connect with us through our um, Twitter, Facebook, and uh, email accounts on the screen. Thank you so much and have a good day, everyone. Bye. Bye. Yes, we will share all the links to the uh, presentations, the videos, and the, and the guide as well in the email. Thank you, everyone.